I'd like to welcome you to our August webinar. My name is Kishore Mahanti. I'm the interim director of CSEE, the Center for Subsurface Energy and Environment at UT. If you'd like to know more about uh, our center, uh, please visit our website. We are basically uh, about 25 faculty members uh, and we work on the fundamental processes in the subsurface, uh, as well as applications in oil and gas, geothermal, uh, carbon storage and hydrogen storage uh, type of problems. One way we interact with uh, industry is through our industrial affiliate programs. Uh, you can see a list over here. The other thing we do is uh, do these uh, webinars for the industry. And we try to do one each month um, on the second Tuesday uh, at this time at noon. All the webinars are uploaded in YouTube channel within a few days. So if you miss one, you can always go back and look at it and you can see the past ones also. The, um, these are the uh, upcoming webinars. Um, the next one is going to be Dr. Larry Lake uh, in the second uh, Tuesday of September. During the summon, uh, webinar, if you have any questions, please don't wait till the end. Write down the question in the Q&A section. And at the end of the seminar, our speaker will answer all, all your questions. So today's speaker is Professor David DiCarlo. He got his PhD from Cornell University and his research interests are multi-phase flow in porous media. Uh, he has used X-ray CT scanning to measure relative permeabilities in complex systems. But he also studies flow stability, use of surfactants and nanoparticles. He'll talk to us today about combining sweep and displacement efficiency. So David. Thank you, Kishore, for the introduction. Um, glad to be here today. Uh, just a reminder again, if you get any questions at any time, just put them in there, but then you got to wait till the end till you get the answer. So that'll be fine though. I'll get to it. So we'll take them at the end. I can go back and show you the slides. Again, type them in when you think of them. Um, it'll be good to have at the end. All right, so I'm going to talk about combining sweep and displacement efficiency for reservoir flooding. I've been a part of some of these um, webinars before, more, more general things. This is going to be quite specific and quite engineering-like. So if you are a reservoir engineer, this one's for you, okay? So just some ideas of reservoir engineering. And these came out from me teaching reservoir engineering here at the University of Texas at Austin. Okay, so... As a reservoir engineer, we know that almost all conventional reservoirs undergo secondary recovery, and there's questions of doing this for unconventional reservoirs also. Um, particular conventional reservoirs, pretty much they all go in, uh, sometime they go under water flooding, some go under gas flooding, sometimes we do something fancier like a polymer or other chemical flooding. And the key question for a reservoir engineer, a key question for, for any type of operator is basically we want to estimate the recovery versus time. Basically, then when I say time, it's how much you've injected or actually actual actual real time. OK, and the way this is conceptualized for reservoir engineer is often two different things. We talk about displacement efficiency and sweep efficiency. I'm going to get into these details in a second here. OK, and then how do we integrate these things into understanding the how we get the total amount out? Because then we can predict how much we're going to get so we can size our facilities. We can understand our profit and loss and our, all the other things are basically downstream of this calculation. OK, so when we talk about total recovery. One way you'll see it in the textbooks is you'll see the total recovery is the original oil in place, OIP, times the displacement efficiency times the sweep efficiency. What is displacement efficiency? Well, displacement efficiency is going to be basically how much oil is displaced from which oil is contacted. OK, so let's look at this this picture here on the right that I've stolen from a different um, 
uh, publication by Azim. Um, here we have on the bottom part, we have an injector well. Here we have a producer well. We're going to have a high perm streak here in the middle. This is a five spot pattern where you're going to be injecting water and you're going to be sweeping out um, oil towards the uh, producer well. And you can see here, basically, this water's kind of come through these sections here. OK, and it hasn't displaced all of the oil. The water's contacted this stuff, but it's only displaced part of the oil. It leaves oil behind basically the different mechanisms. You're going to leave oil behind uh, due to due to, to snap off or any other type of mechanisms. And we can get into all these details. And us academics tend to do get into all these details. And I'll explain some of that a little bit later. So basically, so even though you've contacted these regions, you haven't displaced all the oil. The other part is the sweep efficiency. And you can see here that basically it's swept all this high perm streak, but we haven't swept all the low perm. And there's going to be sweep going from the bottom to the top. And so we're a typical five spot pattern. So this is basically the volume of the oil contacted times the volume of agent injected. So this is in this case, it's a water flood. And the idea is you it's almost a tautology. You multiply these together and it gives you times the original oil in place. And that's going to give you total recovery. OK, so this is kind of conceptually how you can think about how you get the oil out of a reservoir or any type of thing, whether you're doing you're trying to sweep it and put CO2 in. OK. So so typically what we want is this total recovery as a function of time. In some sense, we want this thing RF of T. We don't just want the total recovery. We want to say how much by next Thursday or, or six months from now. OK, so RF here I'm going to use as the recovery factor. And the question is, how can I get this RF of T recovery factor from what we know about sweep of the, uh, displacement efficiency and what we know about sweep efficiency? OK. So there are established methods to get the getting these two. I'm going to review these established methods and then I'm going to talk about how to put them together. OK, so this is kind of what I spent a lot of time in my career thinking about is displacement efficiency. What is an experiment? Over here on the right is a core flood. You originally fill this with oil. You put in your displacing agent, whether it's water for a water flood or gas for a gas flood, and you push it in on one side. You use CT scanning. You use some uh, electrical measurements. You do a whole bunch of different things to understand what's going on in the core, but you measure really what kind of comes out the other side. Okay. And with the, the big thing is you measure the recovery versus time. And often you put this in dimensionless time. It's actually the most useful thing to do because if you do it, if you do your flood really fast, you do flood really slow, it really matters how much you've totally injected. OK, so we often plot these things versus you, dimensionless time, which is basically injection flux times the area times time divided by the pore volume. And the simplest way to think about it is dimensionless time of one is after the injection of one pore volume. So how much oil have you got out when you injected one pore volume of water? If it's a great displacement, if it's like a missable displacement, you will get all the oil out. In real life, you don't get all the oil out. So how do we understand this? And we teach you guys all this stuff, or we've taught you, maybe you guys can remember back in your, uh, in your uh, reservoir engineering days how this all works. Um, there's a theory, we got a whole theory that's based on this, and it's called Buckley-Leverett. And it's based on two different basic concepts that you can conserve mass and that basically you have a Darcy-Buckingham flow equation, which you have sort of a rel perm flow equation. And you can put in capillarity or not, that changes things slightly, but in the general case, if you're doing a long core, it's not gonna change things much. So how does this work again? Just to review, the way they typically do is if you, if you know the rel perms, you can obtain this fractional flow curve versus the saturation of oil or saturation of water. Here's a functional form for how to do it in terms of your rel perms and your viscosities. And the idea is that every saturation has its own velocities and you can find the saturation path at any point within inside your core takes place. And it's a, it's a combination of shocks and refractions. But when you're all done with it, you can basically obtain the displacement efficiency versus time or in some sense the recovery factor versus time for just the 1D flood. OK, so we're just looking at displacement efficiency here. And graphically, Again, if you go back to your reservoir engineering here, this is how it all works. You have your fractional flow curve versus the saturation. You get some sort of curve here. You have some sort of residual oil saturation, which you're not going to get out. 
It's going to depend on your displacing agent. You're going to have a shape of the curve, which is going to depend on your displacing agent and your rock. You're going to have some initial water saturation or some initial saturation. You have this fractional flow curve, and then you do a transformation. And again, this is what, remember there is a transformation, but you can do a, a direct transformation and you can get the saturation profiles versus distance at different dimensionless times. This is before time equals dimensional time of one. And as it goes in long time here, this thing just moves to the right. And as your front goes and displaces, uh, as your water goes and displaces the oil uh, and the water saturation goes up and the oil comes out the other side. And we can measure the recovery factoring versus time. And typically, initially, you're just getting oil out when you put water in until this initial shock breaks through, and then you start getting water and oil out, and, and basically your water cut goes up and your recovery factor doesn't go on this one-to-one -one line. It goes down, and we get more and more out with time. And kind of this is what you need to predict how much money you're going to make from this or how your stuff's going to happen in terms of 1D, this type of displacement. Um, in the reservoir, we don't have 1D, but in the lab we do. And you can, this is, we've, people have spent a lot of time thinking about this whole thing. And the general concept works pretty well. Okay. So just how does this work here again? Well, water flood is the standard. If you do a polymer flood, you're going to favorably shift the fractional flow curves. You're going to get a better recovery factor versus time. You're going to get more out faster. Um, but it depends on how fast you're going to flow it then. Then you can do gas flood that's going to unfavorably shift the fractional flow curves, but it's going to lower the residual. So it might get the higher recovery factor versus time. You can get the higher final thing here, but just might take longer. So this shape of this curve is going to depend on your displacing agent. Okay. Chemical flood will do other changes. These things are generally known. You ask anybody, well, what if I do gas floods? How is it going to change this? You can kind of have a general idea how this is going to take place inside a 1D thing. But the question is, how is this generally going to take place inside your reservoir, which is not a 1D core? Okay. That comes with understanding sweep efficiency. And of course, when you inject fluid into your reservoir, it does not move uniformly in a 1D displacement from one side to the other side. It's going to go in high perm streaks down here. It's going to go in a front here that's going to take longer to go this way than to go straight across. The wells are going to be placed in a certain pattern. Okay. It's typically broken down, or one way to think about it is you have two different types of sweep efficiency. You have vertical sweep, and as you can see here, this one here, the high perm streak, is going to sweep a lot faster than the lower perm. So that's the vertical sweep, but you also have aerial sweep, which is basically how long it takes for these streamlines to go from here to here to here. And these you can almost conceptually think differently, and how do you put those even together as, as, as um, individual units? It's easy to understand. It's not easy, but it's you can still understand one or versus the other. But how do you put that together? That's what I'm going to talk about. But before I do this, how do we just do vertical sweep? Let's talk about vertical sweep. And one way to think about it, and it's to think about it in the same conceptual space that we did displacement efficiency. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about vertical sweep efficiency here. The rocks have different distribution of permeabilities. It all comes in layers. We know these things are layered. We've not all been, but some of us have been to the Grand Canyon. You see the layers. You drive through and you see the road cuts. You see the rocks are in layers. And if you don't think about layers in petroleum engineering, I don't know what to talk tell you about that. But you should be thinking about these things being of high perm and low perm streaks. Okay, and this is a big part of the heterogeneity. So what happens is, though, one way, there's lots of different ways we have of doing this, understanding the heterogeneity. One thing is commonly uses its Dijkstra-Parsons coefficient, so it kind of gives you the distribution of the permeabilities. So in terms of sweep efficiency, the, what I'm going to talk about right now is basically, I'm just going to say these are segregated flow, that the top layer is just going to flow in the top layer. There's not going to be cross flow here. The next layer here, which maybe is going to have a lower permeability, is going to flow a little slower. It's not going to flow back and forth these layers. Conceptually, this actually is a pretty good thing. It depends on how long your reservoir is, but segregated flow is a, is a pretty good assumption here. Okay, so let's understand how we can understand, how, let's under, try to understand how we can do the segregated flow in some sort of um, simple, mathematically constructed way to put this thing together, to get some sort of sweep efficiency versus time. And we could do this the same way we do fractional flow theory for the 1D displacement. Now, this is a 2D displacement here. I'm just going to do tracer flow. I'm going to assume it's perfectly 
displaced here, that there's a front between water and oil, and you've got everything here, but this one's moving faster, and this one's going to be moving slower, and it's going to be moving slower, okay? But there's no displacement efficiency, just sweep efficiency, okay? So there's one way to put this together is we could say, well, we have a fraction of flow in each layer. So this one layer here, the fraction of flow in the top layer is going to be the permeability times the thickness of that layer divided by the permeability and thickness of all the layers. We can actually have how much storage there is in each layer, or the pore volume in the layer, which is going to be the porosity in that layer times the thickness of that layer. And we can get this for all these layers and we can order these things. We can basically calculate the fractional flow in each layer. And then we can order these from the highest ratio of F over C to the lowest. And by doing this, we get a fractional flow curve just like you get for a 1D displacement. And we can make an F versus C curve. And from that, we can use the same Buckley-Leverett type of arguments. Let me show you how that works. So again, here I've ordered this. They don't have to be the top ones in this. It, you, you, we can basically slice and dice these things and move them around so the top one is the fastest one moving one. Um, in real life, it might be the middle one. It might be the bottom one. It depends on the thing. But conceptually, we're going to say it's just flowing each layer. I put the, the higher, the higher uh, permeability the one at the top. OK, so you have these layers. Let's just say you know them all for now, just like we know the real perms. And then you can produce this F versus C curve. So this is the highest perm one, comes from up to this point C1. And then you add in the next layer and you get this, and you get an F versus C curve, which is just like a fractional flow curve mathematically. Now let's think about how the flow takes place versus time and average the saturation. Well, let's look at the saturation. <laughs> average the saturation, sorry, over here. Average the saturation vertically, okay? So this is almost what I showed before, but what I'm gonna hear is the saturation versus space at different times. This is the early times. And if I'm at the early time, this is the top layer, it's gone that far, and this is all full of water now. And then if you're at a little bit behind this, here's the second layer, it's filled up all of these parts versus time. Okay, and we can add them all up, and then this whole thing moves to the right versus time. Okay, again, the same type of way we did before. Now we get a saturation versus space at different times, and we can get an average saturation that's in the rock as a function of total time here. And it looks like that. This is also just the recovery factor curve. Okay, so basically what we made is a pseudo fractional flow curve. We can go all the way to this. Conceptually, it works the same way. But this is going to be key to putting them all together to see how this all works. Okay, so a couple points here. This curve is always convex. And unlike the fractional flow curve, which kind of has an S-shaped curve, this curve will always be convex, which means you'll always have rarefactions. And you're going to have to parameterize this. We don't really know the relative, the, the, all of our layers, but we can kind of get an understanding from, <clears throat> we can get an understanding from, Oh, we can model it. I basically is a better way to say it. And the simplest thing is, is, is and Dr. Lake is a big proponent of it. I'm a big proponent of it now, is this Koval function, because this Koval function will basically have this type of shape. And this has a certain Koval parameter, which basically, if a Koval parameter is one, this goes straight across here. As the Koval parameter goes to 10, it's got a bigger bend, which is more heterogeneous. If the Koval factor is 100, it's got even more bigger bend. OK, so this is maybe you can relate the Koval parameter to the Dijkstra Parsons coefficient. But no matter what, once we have this, if we assume a certain Koval parameter, we can calculate from this fractional flow curve, we can calculate the breakthrough. Just for tracer flow. Just for tracer flow, we can do the same thing. OK, how do we combine these? I'll get to that in a second. OK. So that's just vertical flow. We also know that these things are not big sheets from one end to the other. Our wells are injector wells and our producer wells, and you're going to have a pattern like a five spot pattern, and you're going to have different streamlines that are going to be faster in the middle, and they're going to be going slower on the outside. We can break this down just the type of same way here. Okay, so people have done these experiments, and they're people, you can do a model of this, you can calculate what this is breakthrough is going to look like. In this case, we have basically tracer flow <coughs> in just this 2D environment for the aerial suite. 
You can obtain this from theory. You can obtain this from experiments. You can obtain it from simulation. You can get this EA versus time here or the recovery factor versus time for just sweep. So conceptually, we can break it down into 1D, okay, along each of these streamlines, and then you're going to have aerial sweep, and then we're also going to have vertical sweep. How do we put them all together? Okay, so going back to the aerial sweep, we can also see this um, with a, you can fix this with a, even this, you can fit the coval thing. If you have uniform permeability, it gives a coval number of 1.5 for the recovery factor versus dimensionless time. Now the question is, how do we combine these things? How do we put these together? Say I know exactly where my heterogeneity, and I know exactly I'm doing a five spot pattern. I know exactly I know my rel perm curves. So I've measured, I know my displacement one. I know my aerial one. How do I combine these things to get the total one? Even with the simplest assumption that you're going to do segregated flow, it's not exactly segregated flow, but we're going to do the simplest assumption. Okay. Now, if you go back to the original oil place, well, well, we're going to multiply the displacement efficiency times the other sweep efficiency, which has got our vertical sweep efficiency and aerial sweep efficiency. <laughs> Why don't we just do that to get our total sweep efficiency? Okay. Don't do this. You will get the wrong answer. OK, first of all, the units are wrong. This is going to end up with meters to the fourth over meters to the fourth. Your reservoir is cubic. It's not a it's not a fourth four dimensional reservoir. It's a three dimensional reservoir. If you multiply these together, if you just take these curves and you multiply them together, you're going to find the wrong function because at early times, the displacement the recovery factor is going to go as TD. And if we multiply TD times TD times TD at early times, this is going to go as TD cubed. My recovery factor is going to increase as a cubic. That's not right. OK, so this tautology of how to put sweep and displacement efficiency together doesn't work in practice. It's one way to understand it, but if you actually try to do a calculation, it doesn't work so well. This has puzzled me. Taught reservoir engineering for three years. Couldn't quite figure out how to put this all together. But actually, it isn't that hard to put together if you think about it a little deeper. Let me show you a solution. OK, let's take a step back. We're going to assume segregated flow. We're going to assume that each streamline does not move. Some have short travel times, some have long travel times, whether they're in vertical sweep efficiency or we're, whether we're doing aerial sweep efficiency. And what we want to do is just map the 1D displacement on each streamline. That's the understanding from streamlines. Take a picture at any time and sum them up. Conceptually, people have streamlined simulators. You can go buy a streamlined simulator as opposed to MPEST simulator. And this is conceptually how it works. It maps them back and forth between them. How does this work mathematically in terms of those functions that I just showed you, though? OK, let's do conceptually before I do the math here, though, first. Again, so here is each of my displacement efficiency. I'm going to assume these are all 1D displacements, but just that this one's going faster, this one's going slower, and this one's going slower and slower. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is actually what this means is that the recovery factor, and this one's going to go fast up here and then go slow the rest of the way because this one front's going to come through faster. This front is going through slower, so it's going to take longer to get there. It's just actually changing the time. This one's going slower. It's just going to take longer to get this when I put this on an overall dimensional time. OK, each of these, if I looked at each of these on their own dimensional time, it's the same. But basically, these are changing the dimensional time here. And then once I get that together here, I could just sum them up at any total time here and get the total amount of recovery to get this curve. So again. Same curve here, I just stretch it different dimensionless time. So I just want to set up the time weighted flow for each layer. So this is how I can combine my vertical and my displacement efficiency together. Okay, so each layer has moves at its own speed of F over C. Again, that's the velocity of each layer. At the same total time T, each layer has gone through its own dimensionless time T, TDI, which is different then the overall dimensionless one multiplied by just this factor here. So then the total combined recovery of the vertical plus the displacement, only doing vertical and displacement right now, do aerial in a second, 
I can write it this way. I have to sum up the time weighted ones. I'm not multiplying, I'm summing up the time weighted ones. Okay, now other people said this before. This isn't a huge thing. It's just, just kind of insight. Don't multiply them. It looks like you want to multiply them because that's how one way to think of it conceptually, but when you actually do it in practice, it's this time weighted way. Okay, and yes, it is that simple. It isn't that hard. You just have to think a little deeper. How would you do this in practice? You're going to get F over C for each layer from a Koval description. If you have a Koval description, you can break this into as many layers as you want and get F over C for each of those layers or for a different Koval parameter. How are you getting the Koval parameter? Well, some geologist is going to tell you some Dijkstra parsers coefficient, and there's going to be some sort of functions that are going to tell you how to do this. Okay. Again, this is not new. Will Height's book on water flooding, which is quite old, maybe older than me, I don't know, I'm kind of old, has the same idea, okay? But the, the, the big thing here is I want to do this for all three. This is just vertical displacement. How do I add in the aerial part too? Again, the experiments and simulations give you EA versus time, but they don't give you this F over C. Even if you have a five spot uniform parameter, thing you don't get f over c for aerial sweep okay so the key thing is getting this f over c for this aerial sweep because that is the thing i have to put in the functional form and it isn't that hard we can just run it backwards so this is actually how you do the experiment or how you do the simulation or how you do the the theory you have your five spot pattern or you have your different pattern. You get your recovery factor versus TD. There's a one to one correspondence. So there's recovery factor versus TD to this F over C parameter. So we just run it backwards. Remember, we can go from right to left. If we go this way, you can actually go from left to right. It's a one to one correspondence. And once you have this F over C, then you can use it the same way. To put the aerial in. So there's a complete we can get a complete prescription for doing this whole thing you want to attain the f over c for the aerial for the coval parameterization of the aerial tracer curve okay now we now let's how do we put this together let's say we know our displacement efficiency from experiments at rub firms i combine my displacement with my aerial to get one for each layer okay now the layers have different permeabilities but I'm doing my aerial and my displacement to get it for each layer now. And then I'm going to have a whole functional form for each layer, which is then the input for the vertical for each layer. It uses the same math. It works the same way, but you just basically have to use this as the input. So you take one ED as the input to the aerial to get this one. Then this is the input for the vertical. And that's how you want to build it up. You want to build it up from a 1D core flood to a 2D combined aerial displacement for each layer, to a 3D for combining each layer. Okay, you can follow this through. It's a complete workflow for doing this. Okay, let me give you an example. So I'm gonna do this example. I'm not just gonna use Koval theory for all of my curves. And you can use Koval for displacement efficiency also. Okay. And it's just easier mathematically to put it together. So I'm going to use, so here's my displacement recovery that we've measured this in the lab. And this is the recovery factor versus dimensionless time. And it matches something that gives you basically a coval factor of three. And we're going to say that the saturation change is 0.6. You have a residual saturation of 0.4 here. So this is a displacement curve. It will look something like this in the lab. It will actually have some noise. It will actually not be perfect, but you can basically model this thing here. OK, and you say, OK, maybe a coval one of, th of three fits well. OK, so this is my displacement recovery. So again, this is just the 1D displacement. How do I add that in with the aerial? Well, I'm going to take this thing and use that functional form that I showed a couple slides back here. This one here, I'm going to use the displacement one. I'm going to put in my aerial one here. I'm going to have to know my C's for the aerial, and I'm going to get this aerial one here. And by doing that, I'm going to first of all say my aerial one has a coval factor of two, which is maybe maybe not a perfect five spot, but it's maybe has some um, um, something to do with how the uh, viscosity's changed. We'll just use a coval factor of two. I can take that 
and use this, and it's a simple functional form, and you can see this one spread it out a little bit more here because now I have both the displacement efficiency, which is taking some time for the last part to get through, and the aerial thing, which is taking some part time for those last parts of the um, phi spot to get through. So you can see this is basically take, take it's not all the way through at two. This one is basically almost all the way through here at a dimensionless time of two. Okay, so it's taking a little longer. It's spread out a little longer. I've changed the axis here, sorry. You get less recovery at the same time because you have to combine it with the aerial. Now we can add in the vertical displacement efficiency. Let's just say now we have a bunch of different layers. Some have higher, you're going to have more of a spread here because you're going to have a lot of high perm, not a lot of them. You're going to have some high perm layers. You're going to have some low perm layers. Those are going to vary by a much bigger difference than basically they are within the layer. OK, so I just chose a Como factor of five. And you can see it's even spread it out even further. Look, you're still taking longer time to get through here. And the blue is what you calculate here for the total. And now actually when you're done with this whole thing, you can say basically fit the whole thing with another COVAL function, which is basically just a recovery factor versus time. Again, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the recovery factor versus time and the fractional flow curve or your F over C. And I can say I can just fit this with the COVAL function. The COVAL function doesn't fit exactly right because this is actually spreads it out a little bit more. Functionally, it's not exactly the same, but practically it's pretty good when it comes to reservoir engineering. So when I use these different Koval factors, it comes into overall Koval factor of eight, basically, which is even more spread out. Okay. So we have a way of doing this. It's very straightforward. It's very quick. Okay. As opposed to running a simulator, as opposed to um, making a bunch of assumptions and taking guesses, there's a standard workflow you can follow here. So let's talk about what kind of assumptions and caveats went into doing this whole thing. Is this like a useful thing? Well, I think so. I assume this was segregated flow. In real life, you were going to have cross flow, but in general, I think it's a good assumption as opposed to more cross flow type things. Your mileage may vary depending on how thick your reservoir and how long it is between your wells. You'll have to think about that a little bit, if, see if it's a good assumption for your type of reservoirs. Um, in this calculation, the simple calculation, I assume no mobility effects. So there are mobility effects. If the injected agent has a lower mobility, let's say it's polymer, the flow in the fastest pass will slow down with time, which will make your, 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 your coval factor better, okay? Or if the injected agent has a higher mobility, the fast pass will speed up with time. So the speed of some of those are going to change with time. I can't just say it's just, I go back a couple slides here. I can't just say it's going to be a linear one here with a different F over C. If you have a big change of viscosity, this will be a nonlinear function. But it'll be a nonlinear function that we have a good way to estimate. Okay, and we can just put that nonlinear function here. It's going to work the same way. You're just going to have to put in a little bit more complication. And we can add that. If it's not a big change, I'm not expecting that much nonlinearity. If it's a huge change in, in mobility, you might want to put that in. Again, either of these effects can be incorporated in the model by using a nonlinear translation with time of the displacement function, which I kind of went back forward to. These mobility effects will also change the aerial sweep function. And people have done experiments a long time ago to see how the aerial sweep of function changes with the mobility of function with, with the mobility of effects. Uh, Caudill did some classic experiments down in the 60s and 70s, which I think were just awesome to try to understand this. You can do this in a simulation if you want to do it also. Again, we can basically, you're going to have to add that into some of these sweep functions, which you can just put into a different coval factor. And there should be, again, a one to one correspondence. Okay. All of what I've just been talking about all works if you know everything ahead of time. And of course, in reservoir engineering, we know our reservoir exactly before we do anything, right? Everybody says, oh, yeah, I know exactly that this is going to have all these permeability streaks. I know exactly we're going to have this type of uh, uh, rel perm curves. Yeah, we know that. But we don't know any of that, of course, right? In practice, you don't know any of these things. 
Okay, so how is this going to be useful for me? Well, potentially displacement efficiency can be estimated. You can take some cores out, but the reservoir heterogeneity, th these are gases. Okay, so, so then what's the use of this, Dave? What are you going to do this for? Okay, here is the big key use for me. Other recovery methods alter both the displacement efficiency and the sweep efficiency in known ways. So if you've done a water flood of your reservoir and you're considering to do a gas flood of it, or you're considering to do a surfactant flood, or considering to do a polymer flood, you already have the recovery factor versus time for your reservoir, which is a combination of these three things. And you can just say, let's say it turns out that I looked at my data and it comes out and I can model it and it gives me a coval function of eight or something. And I know my coval function for my typical rock is going to be something like three, like I said before. And my arrow is going to be two. And I say, oh, that means my display, my vertical is going to be five because that matches things up. OK, so I know all that going in. Now I kind of can estimate that from some sort of test that you've already seen from your water flood. And then you could say, hey, I'm going to do my gas flood. If I want to do a gas flood, well, I know that's going to change my coval factor for my displacement efficiency in a certain way. It's going to change my sweep efficiency in a certain way. And you're going to add those all things together. And it's going to change <coughs> how much is going to much oil we're going to get out. And then we can multiply that all together and just give a quick screening fact. You don't have to do any simulation. You just have to look at the data that the reservoir has already told you. And then use the kind of understanding that we already have for how these different agents change both the displacement and sweep efficiency. Again, we have pretty good understanding of these things. We can get a better understanding of doing this back and forth then. OK, without having to do a whole reservoir simulation. OK. Again, I guess the modern things, we'll just throw it all in the simulator, but that takes a bunch of time and work and you got to check this, and you got to check that, you got to do the history match of this. It's a very simple way of doing it. OK, so I want to thank you for your attention for the last 35, 40 minutes. I don't like to go a lot of time. I can't pay attention to more 40 minutes. I'm hoping you guys have some questions for me. Now's a good time to start putting them in there. Um, I'll be looking here again. How we do this now? I get to see all your questions. I'm going to take them one by one and try to give you answers and go from it there. So with that, I'm going to end the slideshow and end my screen sharing here. Moving to other applications. If we were to displace brine and aquifers rich in mineral, earth minerals, what is the best way to start thinking about flooding? Polymer flooding or chemical flooding? So I think this question has to do with basically any type of, you can use reservoir flooding. We talk about it in terms, or I've been talking about it in terms of producing oil. You can also talk about it in producing minerals, um, let's say lithium, or you can talk about even in CO2 flooding here. So in, in terms of, uh, uh, of the minerals here, I guess you have to choose what you're going to begin with. And I assume mainly if you're doing water floods or you're putting in some sort of chemical reaction, chemical reactant or changing the chemistry of the water, or basically just, just, just flooding the aquifer to produce, let's say lithium or some other um, metal, um, that will be more tracer-like. So your displacement efficiency would be pretty good. That way, your reactivity will have to go in your displacement part. Um, but again, these conceptual things all work. You just have to get the right particular things to put it all together. OK, I think that's the way I want to think about it. Yeah, you're going to have a different displacement efficiency. You have a different functional form. You're going to have a different sweep efficiency. It's probably a little bit better because it's going to be more tracer flow like, but you're still going to have the heterogeneities. OK, here's another question. Have you tested this against real reservoir floods? The answer is no, I haven't. But I'm looking for data to do this with and a student to do this with too. So the idea is you're going to have to basically take some real data. And I assume some of you guys out there have gone from water floods to gas floods and you can see how well the, 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 the recovery factor has changed versus time. And there could be thing, ways to ground truth it or even actually to do to do hind casting where we can just estimate when you went from a water flood to gas flood, how well it would work and then keep the data for how well the gas flood, keep it away from the predictors, me and potential students, then see at the end how well does it does it predict here. That'd be great. 
Question, what is the issue with combining recovering agents? I don't understand the question again. What is the issue with combining recovering agents? I'm going to take that as basically, why do you have to change things when you change the recovering agent? Um, the main point is gas floods will give you really good displacement efficiency. How about I put it in terms of between gas and water? Gas floods give you great displacement efficiency. You do a CO2 flood with a core and you do it vertically stable and you're going to get out all that oil. But in practice, it's going to mess up your sweep efficiency. Your sweep efficiency is going to go bad. OK, so you, your, 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 your cobalt factor for your sweep efficiency is going to get worse. So you're going to have to put those th two things together. And how do you put them together? Is, is the display advantage from displacement efficiency so much more that, it, that the sweep efficiency doesn't matter? Um, or is it faster and we're just going to care that the sweep efficiency is going to matter? Or how long should we do our gas flood here? Because we know the sweep efficiency, lots of it's going to come slow and slow and slow. You kind of need to make those predictions and each agent is going to behave differently. In addition, uncertain unknown efficiencies, we may not know the oil in place very well. Oh, yeah. We don't know that very well at all, especially for unconventionals. OK, comment on how uncertain oil in place affects the comparisons of alternative recovery processes. Well, that's a good question. Um, that's going to be basically oil in place is going to be basically your pore volume in place, too. Oh, boy, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to assume that somebody's done some good mapping. And somebody's done some good uh, understanding of some well testing and everything else to give you the whole pore volume of reservoir. And you know how much you've injected. If you have a big uncertainties in the oil, oil in place, which is often a bigger thing in unconventionals than conventionals. For conventionals, you're going to have less uncertainty. For unconventionals, you're going to have a big uncertainty. But again, you're not doing the secondary recovery for the unconventionals as such. So um, that's a good question. Um, it can be added. I haven't thought exactly how through to add in how much that going to, you're going to assume a certain dimensionless time, but if your dimensionless time is off, and then everything's based off of that dimensionless time for each thing. Uh, yeah, maybe it goes in the same way. Maybe that's a different thing to add. That's a good question. I'll be thinking about that one. Can you give me more detail on how this can be used to determine if I should put a field under a CO2 flood? Sure, let's just take that for example here. So again, I have a field. Do I want to put it under CO2 flood? Hopefully you have some water flood data from this. Okay, hopefully it's been under water flood. You have some sort of recovery versus time. You've seen that water flood peter out. You can model that to get some sort of sweep efficiency. You can model that to see basically how well the water has swept your reservoir. Okay, now presumably you have gonna have some sort of guess of the rocks. And you're gonna say, well, I've left behind 50% of my um, of my oil, because water flood is going to leave behind 50% or so. Um, and some of that's from displacement and some of that's from sweep. So maybe you say, well, uh, uh, a gas flood is going to give me a better displacement efficiency. It's going to, instead of leave 50% behind, it's only going to leave 10% behind. So I'm going to change that. So I'm going to change that ED function. OK, we know how that ED function is going to change if I did a gas flow the whole time. And then we can basically estimate how the coval factor is going to change for the sweep efficiency. It's going to get worse. OK, so you can just hopefully if you have enough data, you can say, OK, my ED is going to go this way this far. So my functional form is going to shift this way. My coval, if I put it in terms of coval and delta S, my delta S is going to get bigger. My coval is going to get better, worse. Um, and my cobalt for my sweep efficiency is going to be worse. And I'm going to say, OK, I'm just going to get twice as bad for my cobalt. My cobalt instead of five is 10. My, my um, delta S has gone from 0.6 to 0.9. And you can just multiply that all together. You can just use the same thing um, and then calculate how fast that, that gas is going to come through. It's going to give you the same curves if I can go back to the um, sharing here.
it's going to give you, you're going to get a different curve for this. You're going to get a different curve for all of these things. Okay. And then you can put them together and get a total different final one like we did here. So you're going to, if you change this to 10, if I change this delta to 0.9, it's a straightforward calculation to see how the recovery factor is going to take place. Now, if it's underwater flood, your delta S is not going to be 0.9. It's going to be 0.3 now because you've gotten out 0.6 of it or something like that. Um, and then you can estimate, it, you'll just be able to get a recovery factor versus dimensionless time of poor volumes of gas injected here. Okay, you have to subtract out all the oil that's come out originally, your oil in place has changed. Um, but again, it should be somewhat straightforward. And this could be implemented in, in 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 almost just a simple workflow. Okay, there are details. It needs to be ground truth. From other, if you're if you're a gas if your company likes to do gas flooding, you're going to need to ground truth this against a lot of the gas floods you've done already. Um, because I just told you I'm going to double the cobalt factor, but that's just a guess. In real life, you're going to have to check that against other actual data. Okay. But presumably, if you have enough data, you're going to say, oh, instead of doubling, I got to multiply it by four. And that gives me good estimates. And I assume that most companies who are basically big in this, they have other ways of doing this, but this is another way to check it. And the software will run real fast and real fast and real robust. OK, another question. One of your famous colleagues has long argued that CO2 EOR is a flow past the oil process, not a fluid pushing an oil bank process. Can you accommodate that concept in the Buckley Leverett basis of what you showed today? Okay. Um, this is a question from another one of my former colleagues, Steve Bryant. So the idea being that, let me go back to my slides. Share. Okay. So the idea being, let's go back to this vertical sweep efficiency. If you put gas in here, this one's going to go real fast here. And then this one's going to be producing really fast here. And then basically you're just going to get that. And the gas breakthrough happens really fast because your vertical sweep is going to be a lot worse when you put in a worse viscosity ratio. So, but now you're going to be in this. So this one's going to be in this part of the curve where you're barely getting out oil here because you're on the real end part of the rarefaction here. But again, maybe this slow one is going to be here, but it's just going to be trickling along. Okay. So maybe this one isn't a flow pass. Maybe this is still getting pushed. When you add this all together, it doesn't really matter uh, that it's, you know, that this one's going slow and this one's going fast. This one's going fast and a little bit, and this one's going slow and a lot. Again, it's that total rate versus TD that matters. Um, again, I'm assuming all segregated flow for this to be the case. If you're basically doing some sort of stripping where you're basically catching up oil from the outside, or you're basically what's happened is you've you've stripped all this through all the oil out and the oil is 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 moving uh, into this region, then this model won't work so well. Um, this is based on that idea. And I guess the proof is in the pudding to check it against gas reservoir flooding. I think that'd be an interesting thing to do to see, hey, does this work at all? I mean, and sometimes things will give you the right answer for the wrong reasons. And sometimes you get the wrong answer for the right reasons. Is it a potential way that that is conceptually makes sense and puts things together? That's the big thing for me. Um, and it needs to be tested. For me, the biggest thing is is between going from a secondary flood here and basically how to put this together in a reservoir engineering standpoint. Again, mainly people, if you're really going to do something big, everybody's going to want the reservoir simulation. And I understand that we've got big computers and we've got big fancy computers and we spend a lot of money on those big fancy computers. So we're going to use them. 
But even before doing that, maybe it's just good to do some simple screening with some simple understanding of how this all works with some software that will give you some general ideas and then see if it fits with simulation. So that's the other thing we can test is actually we can test it against simulated data. So I want to thank everybody for paying attention and making it through this whole 50 minutes, almost an hour of me talking to just a screen. Guys in there. It's always weird for me and I'm glad we're back in person. But thanks again until next time, which will not be me, will be Dr. Larry Lake on September 12th. He will be presenting a little more august colleague. It should be a very interesting webinar as they all always are. Please come back for that. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys there. All right, signing off.